Good day, leaders. My name is Michelle Campagnola Polson, the creator and host of the MCP PhD video podcast, where I discuss leadership and organizational change with everyday leaders. And today's guest is Roberta Stevens Miller. And we are going to do a Q&A session today. Together, Roberta and I are going to answer three questions on the topic of leadership and organizational change. And before we dive in there, let me read a little bit about Roberta so you can meet her as well. So here we go. Roberta is originally from Manitoba, Canada. She lives with her spouse in Steinbeck, Manitoba, Canada. She currently works for a federally regulated food processing plant where she is the health and safety supervisor. She has worked full time most of her career, first as a nurse and now as a health and safety professional. She has experience in organizational change through government cuts, as well as with the present situation with COVID-19. Roberta, welcome. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I love Roberta. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so without further ado, Roberta, let's just dive into the first question. Are you ready? Yep. All right. First question for today is, how can leaders help make their employees feel more safe going back into the office post the COVID-19 quarantine? What comes up for you when you think about that question? So as I won't just even say as a leader, but personally, um, we need to ensure, first of all, that the employees feel safe, okay? Not just because they're returning from this continuing COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. but all the time. Okay, that's my job, health and safety, right? Mm -hmm. We make policies, procedures, and encourage people, train them, and then have to enforce it, right? Mm -hmm. um, no one wants to bring any kind of illness or injury to anyone, whether that be home or work. And so we encourage people to obey the rules, mm -hmm. to keep us safe. Um, as a leader, our employees need reassurance mm -hmm. and they should feel safe to return to work just as they felt safe coming to work prior to this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. So as a leader, we need to listen to our employees' fears, okay? So they're very real, right? Not only for them, but for us, for all the people that they work with or live with or visit or meet in the grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I need to lead by an example and do as I ask, not um, tell them to do it and then expect them to do it without my own leadership, right? Mm -hmm. I still have a job to do and so do they. Mm -hmm. And they're scared. They think about things like, okay, I'm returning to work, but what kind of job do I have when I get to work? Because I've been told that, we can't work as many hours or we can't do as many things or we don't have product as much as um, we would normally have. Uh, they've been off for a long time and some people have gotten used to the time off. Okay. So now they're coming back to structure again, mm -hmm. which doesn't really meld well with human nature. Okay. We uh, like to be doing what we want to do and coming back to work and then being told, well, now you have to wear a mask and you have to wear a face shield and you need to wear this and you need to wear that and you need to wear it all the time and you can't take it off except to eat your lunch. Oh, and don't sit beside anybody, right? We as humans are social beings and this is tough for everybody, not just the people returning to work, but the people that are waiting at home for them to come back to work. Right. So in our workplace, we actually have a training session put together for people that are being recalled back to work. Mm -hmm. um, it shows them how to properly put on the mask, how to make it more comfortable, how to wear the face shield. We've got daily and periodical cleaning of all the um, 
communal spaces. My cafeteria now looks like a classroom facing the teacher, but everybody's six feet apart, okay? We've got cubicles that are meant just for your lunch. It's got mm -hmm. your name or your number and you mm -hmm. can, that's where it stays and mm -hmm. nobody touches it. And, mm -hmm. um, and you're six feet away from the person who's sitting down to eat their lunch. Like we're doing all of that social distancing and stuff mm -hmm. and signage. There are so many signs in my workplace. I'm not sure that anybody reads them anymore because there's that many signs. Okay. <laughs> it's just, it's a whole new world. And the worst yep. part is it's a whole new normal. Right. And it's, it, I think as long as I maintain that um, open door policy where they can come and talk to me if the mask doesn't fit right or the face shield's uncomfortable or this person's doing that or that person's doing this, right? And and being there to talk to them about it. Like I, I've, I've been overjoyed, shall we say, with some of the response that people have given me in the regards to they feel comfortable at work. So... I think that's kind of, it's, it's having that listening ear. I'm going to refocus my uh, video there. There you go. Roberta, there's so much to unpack there because um, you, you talked about a lot of things. You talked a lot about, um, well, psychology, human psychology. <laughs> reality of the situation is uh, people don't like to be told what to do, especially when it comes to, like you said, the social nature or, um, uh, you know, we, you need to stay in this box and that's it with your yep. behavior in certain, in certain areas, uh, like it or not. And we have to too, but still, uh, so I think how that message is communicated, like, like you were saying and walking the walk. Uh, in a leadership role is really important. Listening is extremely important um, because you feel, I think that, you know, it's a lack of control. You know, some of your liberties are taken away, but if you feel empowered, even in this situation that we're all going through to, you know, come, you know, come and say, hey, I have a problem with, with how this fits or how I don't feel, I don't, I haven't, this doesn't feel right or I haven't figured it out or, uh, you at least feel empowered to communicate about it as opposed to um, this is the way it is, suck it up, too bad. Well, and that's the big f factor, okay? There's some people who are claustrophobic. Right. And now I'm telling them to cover their face. Right. And their mouth and their nose and right. not touch this and not do that, right? Yes. And sure. I'm sure that everybody was having a good little chuckle when they showed them all how to wash their hands correctly, you know, like... <laughs> You would think that that's something that was ingrained in us from childhood, but people forget. Yes. You know? So, so when people, so, so what I hear from you is when people are being asked to come back into the office with all of the signage, all the safety procedures, all the, the appropriate safety mechanisms, even though all those safety mechanisms are important, really what I hear from you is, 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 the leadership aspect of it because you can have all the signage and all the masks and all the ABC tools and, and materials. Um, but if it's enforced in a way that is um, too overbearing, then people can become more anxious and feel less safe, less safe. Is that what I kind of want to hear you saying? Yeah. If somebody's again, as human beings, we don't, take well to being told what to do, when to do it, or how to do it. Mm -hmm. But if we get that buy-in from our employees that, do you want to take this home? Do you want this COVID to ever end? Like, do you, and then suddenly you have people saying, well, I don't want to take it home. You know, what do I have to do to prevent that from happening? Right. And, and then they do it. Right. I mean, I'll always have somebody who I'm going to have to remind to pull the mask up on your nose or bring your face shield down past your chin or different things like that. But with the reminder, there's no, or you're going to lose your job because right. of it. Right. Exactly. Right. There's no, um, 
remember what it's basically my sentence to some people that I are constantly telling to do what they're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. is remember you're not just hurting yourself. Right. Right. And I think that there's in any human being, no, no matter how hardened you are, there's always a tiny piece of your heart that kind of gets that. Yeah. And in, in years that I've been in leadership, it's, um, I try to make sure that I base most of my comments on this could be happening in your own home. Right. And as soon as I can bring home mm -hmm. that touch of home to work, it's like, Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well I get it now. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let me ask you a question with regard to the food processing plant in particular because um, I know a lot of meat processing plants had been shut down with COVID-19 in the United States. Um, so I'm not familiar with it is in Canada, but um, is that a job where people performing their job have to be close together or can they be spaced apart? Like, has that been a challenge in the food processing plant? Um, we have some issues on certain areas. And so in that area, they, they know that if they can't keep that social distance that they then have to make sure that they're wearing masks and face shields both okay. and because it's because it's a food processing plant they've got a lot of other ppe that they have to wear anyways they've got hair nets and safety glasses and hearing protection and smocks like they and aprons and you name it and so they're not strangers to wearing ppe it's just now I'm adding a little bit more to the bulk, right? Right. Gotcha. But so you might, um, in our workplace, you might be able to be across from each other and just wear your masks. Or you may be in a, like I say, they go to the cafeteria. They don't have to wear their mask while they're eating because they're six feet apart, right? right. Like, so... Again, if they can, and they, they're well aware that on our production floor, a mask has to be, a mask or a facial has to be worn all the time they're on the production floor because we're dealing with food and other people's uh, lives, right? Well, in closing of this question, I would say, then I was remiss in what I said before. I think it's a combination of both. Um, it is the leadership it is the walking the walk. It is being an open ear to listen. It's kindly reminding. It's put. It's re, it's a reminder uh, that hey, you're not just impacting yourself. You're impacting others. But it is also taking the rules seriously, yeah. uh, enforcing them, and not being lax with them. And that makes people feel safe because you can have all the rules in in in, in the um, equipment, but if it's not enforced, people are, will catch on to that very quickly. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, wait a minute. Major, this. major great finds. That, that person doesn't have, that person didn't do it, you know? And yeah. so, we, and that's just not the point. The whole point is to keep everybody yeah. safe. So yeah. yeah, excellent. Excellent, Roberta. Um, from two, from two sides, from the enforcement side, but then also walking the walk and how to, how to enforce it as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good. Those are good lessons for viewers watching. Perfect. Thank you. Question number two. Describe one of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome as a leader and what you learned from it. Well, this is going to sound really crazy, but my biggest challenge was letting go. Okay. I was a single mom for a good peri period of my life. I was the sole caregiver, provider, you know, all that sort of jazz. And I find that I, um, I've always been self-motivated. I'm a do-it-myself kind of girl, you know, stuff like that. So when I got into a leadership position, that's at first what I thought it was, that I had to do this myself, get out there and, and get it done because, you know, nobody was going to do it as good as I could sort of thing. And then I realized that letting it go and delegating or assigning a task or, or getting someone involved, suddenly I wasn't the only star. Let's put it that way. There was other people that, were, that had a lot to give. 
Absolutely. You know, uh, part of my job is I run a health and safety committee where we have um, managers, we have maintenance, we have employees from the floor, things like that, that all come to this meeting once a month and we hash out issues, right? Okay. And I, right from the very start, when I started to learn to let go, I actually said, you know what? I might be the health and safety supervisor, but I am only here to record what you guys talk about. And at first, even my boss said to me, well, that's not how it should be. You should be running this. And I said, well, no, I shouldn't be running it. You guys are the people who know what's going, like who know right. where the issues are, who know where the problems are, know how much we can fix, know how much those things are going to cost. And I don't need to know all that. I just need to know what I can do like mm -hmm. to help you make it all happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And so once I had my little blurb and whatever else, and finally let go, there's still times where, oh, okay, step, take a deep breath, take a step back. You know, you, you don't have to do this all by yourself. Yeah. And, um, by letting go in my professional life, yeah. I've learned to let go a little bit in my personal life, which Absolutely. I needed to do as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I really relate to that as well, Roberta. I think that's a challenge for most leaders uh, to some extent, but some more than others. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and that can be challenging when, if you're an, especially newer in the role, um, because you haven't yet connected with your team yet in, in it's not a, it's not a family yet. You're, yeah. you're we're all just establishing that relationship. So you can be in a meeting and, uh, and say, all right, well, what do you think? What do you think? You can get crickets. And yeah. then, so the natural response of that leader could then we'll just swoop in and, uh, and I'll start talking. But really, that doesn't serve the committee or just doesn't serve the team really well. No, not at all. No. no. And so, um, so I, I love that. I, I love that idea. It's like, I'm just here. I'm just here sitting back. I'm collecting. I'm listening. I'm observing, putting it together. And then we'll see what we can do with that information. Yeah, I like that. Um, another reason why is, in, especially, in the, especially in the beginning, is you don't know people's strengths yet. That's you haven't true. been able to yeah. assess to say, well, I can't, you know, it's hard to let go when you don't know if who's you're letting go pick it to up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so that happens when you build the trust. Uh, you know, a lot of times um, it, in leadership, we talk so much about establishing trust to where your direct reports um, trust you, but it really works both ways. I mean, you have to then establish you know, trust with your um, direct reports and vice versa where you trust them to be able to let go because they've proven yeah. over time too. So, um, you know, my last um, company, a lot of leaders I, I saw around me who had a difficult time letting go really wished they could let go of their work, but it required time to train new people and they could never, they were just so bogged down with work that they never really could find the time. Is that something think, relatable to you? Yeah, at first, yes. But now I'm, I guess, at the stage in my life, too, where it do, you don't have to let go of large chunks. Mm. Start with little chunks, right? Yeah. So um, we, I used to do all the inspections. There's 12 of them to do a month, right? Wow. Yeah. And, I've got a, and I've got a team of 10 people on my committee. So why wouldn't they be doing some of those inspections, right? And it's funny because it, each time I change them up, because I don't give the same inspection to the same person because you need a new, you need a different set of eyes. Absolutely. So if I give, if I give somebody who works in that area an inspection, they're not going to do it the same way as somebody who doesn't work in that area. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the person who works in the area sees it every day. So to them, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Whereas the next guy who doesn't work there, who, only walks by all of a sudden notices little things like uh, a sign that's damaged. Absolutely. Right. It's something yep. as silly as that. Right. Mm -hmm. And at first they weren't really receptive of that. 
Okay. In fact, even my own boss was like, but that's what we pay you to do, right? And I said, well, yeah, you actually pay me to make sure they're done. You don't pay me to do them, basically. Yeah, you pay me to make sure they're done and done well. Yes. Yeah. And so um, that became, like I said, that little piece. I still do six of the 12. Right. Because most times there's always somebody missing. So I get stuck with their, I won't say stuck. Yeah. I get yeah. to do theirs. Absolutely. And um, so it's, and, and lots of times I actually have a few people on my committee who'll say, oh, well, so-and-so's away. Do you want me to do theirs? Whereas, hey, yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Like that's, that's a thousand more steps that I have to, don't have to take today. <laughs> like, yeah. whatever. And I think sometimes, again, if some of these, some leaders who were in a, who are in a situation like I was when I first started where like, I can do this better and I'm not mm -hmm. going to give it to anybody and I'll just do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my boss will love me and whatever else. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was giving those little things away, little chunks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have a massive report that needs to be done every month, maybe a part of it could be done by someone else. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they, they feel good about the part they did and they take on a little bit more and training is not as hard as everybody thinks it is. It's just a matter of uh, sometimes letting go of the, the lead and letting them go. And because most people that work underneath you, you wouldn't have hired them if you didn't think they knew what they were doing. True. And you'd right? be surprised how people step up when given the opportunity. Yeah. Like if you open a door, Yep. even a crack right yep. something's going to come in it and so that might that might be someone who maybe you're not aware of this maybe you have somebody in your in on your team mm -hmm. that has a skill that they're honing at home right and waiting to let it go shall we say yeah. Yeah. and you open the door that crack and suddenly you go holy cow i, I didn't know you were into that Absolutely. right and and that's I think again too, it's um, when I've, because I've finally learned to let go, there's, like I said, there's still times where Honest. yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I can do it better <laughs> or I go, I go back after and make sure it's done, you know, whichever that's, that's just who I am. And maybe that's because of my um, being a Virgo, apparently we're like that. Okay, <laughs> I, whatever. Claim your <laughs> that's our astronomy. Yeah, exactly. You know, but um, yeah, it's like I said, it was really hard at first. So let me ask you a question. I've got two two questions follow up with, uh, that come to mind. Number one, what if leaders watching? are honest with themselves and deep down feel that it threatens their job security in some way to let go. What advice would you say to that, uh, to viewers watching who feel that way? Well, then, well, one thing is you're not very secure in your job. That's maybe the bluntest way I could put it. And second of all, by allowing so when you're in a leadership position and you want your environment to grow and your team to excel at what they do and, and showcase you as a leader, you, you got to step back and say how insecure, you know, like if you have that insecurity, it's definitely time to let go in some respects. Yeah, and I, I agree. And I think it's, it's about how you spend your time and your energy. So if you're spending your time um, doing the, the work at all levels, yep. even that you're only one person. So, so how are you best served? I mean, if you're in a leadership role where you can influence change differently when you're in a leadership role and you can clear obstacles. I remember one, um, one direct report I had uh, years ago, she's just a total rock star. But when she would come to me, she was like a freight train. That's how I saw her. She was just, she was just <laughs> loud, but she'd get stuck. She'd have an yeah. obstacle. She'd come to me. That would, and I'm like, that's what I, all I need to do is just 
help this one person clear whatever obstacles she has <gasps> once it gets solved there she there she was so she just yeah. plowed right through into the next one well sometimes it's you that know? redirect the redirection right like yeah. uh you can have somebody who um who looks good for your job let's put it that way okay you think that they're kind of a threat to you yeah let's go back Some, to that sometimes showing that you're both on the same plane shall we say yeah stops the threat it does because they want to work with you then instead of trying to go after your job let shall we say right Ab absolutely all yeah. right the second follow-up question i had for you roberta was let's say i'm a leader and i and i'm working on letting go <laughs> okay because it's a process and um and it feels good and everything's great. And then one of my direct reports really makes a big mistake. And it, and, and it, it was an important task, it was delegated out and they made a big mistake. We handle the situation at the time, we rectify it, explain to the associate what happened. Okay, but let's say that leader then feels anxious because they got heat from their superiors or whoever else because of the mistake that happened on their team so any advice for uh for a leader in that situation who did let go and got burned well that's always going to happen there's always going to be that one chance that someone um had a bad day and that's what made the failure right so again that letting go part is that encouragement to that person yeah. like you know owning up to like your boss i mean i've owned up to my boss and said i'm the one who asked them to do it exactly you know i maybe didn't have my eye on the task as often as i should have you know like own up to your issues because mm -hmm. again if you You'll never fully let go if you can't let go. Okay. So <laughs> let you know what I'm I'm trying to say here. Um you you can you can tie yourself in knots and yeah. get to the point where you're not ever gonna let go because you think that everyone will make a mistake and make you look bad. Okay. S s learn from people's mistakes that's what you're taught or told as you grow up right yeah is that if you have an issue or you make an error you correct it and you carry on from there yeah. and if you um want to maintain the let go shall we say is it's now in the past and let's head towards the future right i that's i guess what i i yeah, could say i i love that I absolutely love that, Roberta. Um, one of my previous uh, mentors in business had said, uh, Michelle, as a leader, you share all the wins and you take all the losses. So yeah. if one of you, and that just reminds me exactly what you just said, that if, if uh, anyone in your team makes a mistake, own up to it, apologize for it, have a solution to help prevent it in the future and move forward because accidents and mistakes, they happen all the time. Yeah. And that's just a part of life. You yeah. bet. And definitely a part of business. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And I think also, too, the last thing comes up for me, Roberta, is it really depends on how you perceive your role as a leader. Like, I think some people feel, uh, and everyone's on the spectrum, of course, but like some people feel like, okay, so I'm the leader. So therefore, I must take on three times as much work and work yeah. until 11 p.m. at night um, to release the burden of my team. And there is, there is some, I think, there is some truth to that, that you do want to make your, your team's life easier, but not by multiplying the work on yourself. It's appropriately finding the right work and delegating the right types of tasks as they change and evolve yeah. um, to solve different problems and get the right people involved to uh, help. But I think a lot of people, I think some leaders have that mentality, like, well, I'm getting paid more. 
Um, I'm, I'm salaried. Um, I'm an exempt employee. My, my employees are hourly. So therefore, um, so instead of, in, instead of pushing to get another direct report, which is what I really need, I can just absorb or, and those types of things. Um, and I just think that's, uh, you know, it is what it is sometimes, but I don't think it's sustainable. I mean, you're only, you're, you know, it's well, you can't. You should blood. Okay. You're going to burn out. Yeah. Well, it'll eventually it'll come back to haunt you, shall I say, right? Like, um, a good leader comes from a good leader, okay? Hmm. And in what, my what workplace, you mean by that, what, what I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I have a, I have a boss, who is works very early hours leaves early in the afternoon because that works with her scheduling right like that works she's there when the morning starts um she's available anytime and she's the type of person who says when she leaves in the afternoon you are only here till such and such a time and when you go home the work can stay on the desk because it's still going to be here tomorrow so I think when you have a, le a good leader, someone who, uh, I'll put it to you this way, Michelle, I feel that the job I have now, I've worked all my life towards. Okay, and so I'm going to have a really hard time when it's time for me to retire, because I've got a good boss, and I've got a good job, and I've got a good team, and do I really want to leave it all? But there comes a time in your life when you've got to hand the reins over to someone else. Right. So you need that leader ahead of you to be the leader you want to, to portray the leader you want to be, right? Pass the torch. Yeah, I, I love that. Good leaders make good leaders. Or good leaders you know, become good leader. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I've sat through a ton of, like, supervisory leadership training, different things like that throughout my career, both as a nurse and as a health and safety professional. And had someone in the audience say, yeah, I had a really bad supervisor and I'll never be like them. But yet, in the conversation of the day, you hear that leader that they didn't want to ever be. Right? How do you point that out to somebody? Well, by being a good leader and saying, you didn't want to be like this person, but I can show you a trait that's them. What a perfect segue into our <laughs> third and final question, which is, yeah. <laughs> Roberta, what are the top three qualities or traits that leaders should have and why? So the first one that I wrote down was integrity and honesty. I, it's hard to not have one without the other. Yeah. Okay. Certainly. So whether it's giving proper credit where credit's due, mm -hmm. okay, for accomplishments done or acknowledging, you know, that mistakes were made, like we talked about before, mm -hmm. and making corrections and, and, and just putting safety and quality first, mm -hmm. um, as leaders, we have to exhibit that integrity. Um, as a leader with the honesty part of things, you got to do what's right. Okay, even if that's not the best thing, but, you know, for the current project you're in or whatever, but you need to do what's right. Trust and respect is earned. It's easily lost and impossible to ever gain back. Ooh, hold on. <laughs> Let's go there for a second. <laughs> I, I, I may disagree with you, I think, on that one. Uh, I, with regard to the trust ever regained back. Part. It depends, of course, on the um, on the nature of uh, uh, I don't know of, of the issue um, that's behind the lack of trust. But um, but I, I'm curious to, to see what you to, to probe that a little bit more with you, if you don't mind. Um, well, if if some if a leader apologizes and realizes to the team, listen, I made a mistake. Let's repair. Do you think that that's possible? I think if you have that, um, if you already have a basis of that, yes. then yes. But to come clean um, and not have already had that trust 
or, or to have that respect to start with, they're going to mistrust you for a while before you'll ever get that respect back. It's going to take a lot longer. Yes, I agree. Right? Yes. So there has to be that. I think the platform is that um, to get that respect, hopefully before you make that first mistake. That's that true. First, you know, that the, if you can't be honest with the people that you work with, yeah. who can you be honest with, right? Like these are the people who are going to stand beside you day by day, go through the hardships, the mistakes, the errors, the corrections, the attaboys and the oh yeah. my goodnesses and whatever else, right? Yeah. Um, but I think too that um, when I say that statement, there already has to be a basis before you lose the trust. Mm -hmm. So if you lose the trust after you've already created a platform, that's where I find that it's a little bit more difficult to gain it back. Right. Like if you've got, if you got the platform, you make an error, you apologize, you right. can get back on the platform, shall we oh, say. Oh, you're absolutely right. I, right. I couldn't agree with you more, Roberta. Because um, we're human and as leaders, we're, we're going to make mistakes. It, yeah. it could be a simple thing as, you know, you're running to a meeting or, you, or you're tired or you're grumpy. I mean, you, you try to be cheerful and, and, and positive every day, but you're a human being. And you could just say something to an associate that it came off okay, but maybe it could have been better. I yeah. know I've done that. And then afterwards, I've circled back because I was rushing and my stomach was growling and I was tired <laughs> and I was grumpy. And then I said, and I just said something to an associate. And then afterwards, I'm like, oh, I, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't really great. And circle back and say, hey, by the way, I'm sorry if that came off um, poorly. You know, I, I just was rushing. I apologize. Um, at least in my experience, it's just like, oh, yeah, no, you're fine. Um, yeah. But, but, um, but, but when you have that trust, that connection, those those minor uh, grievances are, are immaterial. Even if there's something bigger, like you said, if you have that foundation, like building a house, if you have the found, a strong foundation, then you can take a windstorm. Yep. Um, but I would I would even say, like to your point, like let's say you've just been a horrible leader your whole <laughs> your whole time. You have an established relationship with your team. You uh, take credit for their work. You punish them, uh, punish associates in front of one another. You're just doing everything against, against, against the handbook, <laughs> not in the handbook, right? Yeah. Um, and your associates don't trust you. Okay. If you see the light, to your point, and then you say, "All right, team, I'm very sorry. Starting today, there's going to be a new me. You better believe it's going to take a while, <laughs> and you will be tested." Oh, every, uh, I mean, every which way, right? Uh, every which way, yeah, yeah. exactly right. I, I always tell, or I don't always, sometimes I get um, where I haven't ate lunch and I'm hungry and <laughs> I'm a little bit more snappy, shall we say it? And I've done the whole comeback and say, you know what, I just have to let you know, and my family will actually back me up on this. I'm just a Sasquatch when I'm hungry. <laughs> Okay. And lots of times that'll go get, you'll get a little bit of a chuckle and people will think, oh, okay, I can relate to that. Cause I kind of do that too. Right. Again, I, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer that if I'm in error, I will apologize mm -hmm. and I'll make an effort. I've apologized to my own children for getting upset with them for something that they couldn't have changed. Sure. So, and I treat my team like family, shall we say, like that's kind of where it gets to if you want to get that integrity and honesty and respect and trust yeah, all in one little lump, right? It does. And I think what lends to that for me is um, in the most professional way possible, but you, but you mentioned family, Roberta, is, um, is love. Like I am not perfect. I've never been and I've never claimed to be and I've never worried about being perfect because in my in my brain I've always I've always felt that if you can translate with time some people you connect with right away sometimes it takes a while to build those relationships right but however long <laughs> it takes if you if you establish and translate that feeling of I care about you 
I genuinely care about you. And even like, I'm, you know, a professional, I love you. I want you to succeed. Yeah. If you translate that, then all, then it doesn't matter if I mean, you try to, you try to always speak in the right words and you try to always be the best leader hundred percent of the time. But when you fall short, you're human. And I think because well, they, they yeah. already know you, you love them and, and they know yeah. that, you know, they love you. So, yeah. 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 I love that. Okay. Yeah. So integrity and honesty. Yep. Number one. Number two, communicate. Be become a communication expert by being a good listener. Um, a lot of people think communication is me telling you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, why to do it, so on and so forth. Instruction and discipline is definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. But you also have to listen and listen with your heart, okay? because it's an important part of communication. Um, listening doesn't just mean, yeah, 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 I hear you. It's actually opening your ears and listening and actually hearing what they have to say. Because part of it is, there's a ton of people out there that have some really good points, some really great ideas. And if you don't listen and you just talk, that communication you don't become that communication expert because you just haven't heard anything that they said. And often, even I'm going to go back to my health and safety committee. At first, before I learned to let go properly, that's exactly what I'm sure some of them thought. Yeah, yeah, you're really listening. Uh, you know, what are you going to do about it now then? Right? And now when somebody comes to me with, an issue I they think I'm crazy but I say you know can you write it down and can you tell me who else is aware of it and and so that I'm not just taking this idea making it happen because let me put it this way I have a reputation at work if it won't get done go call Roberta <laughs> so I still have that power I guess is how I could put it and some days I feel like a cop, but listening and communicating have to go hand in hand. That's what I feel anyways, as a leader. Absolutely. I was on a webinar, I attended a webinar last week, um, and the presenter had said, gone are the days of the sage on the stage where yes. the leader communicates and tells everybody how it's going to be. Gone are those days. And now are the days, especially the information age and people are more aware and different changes in leadership styles. Now are the days of leaders being guides on the sides, guides by their sides, excuse me, guides yeah. by their sides. And so, you know, being, anyone will tell you that being a mentor or a coach uh, and a form of a leader is simply about not telling somebody what to do. Uh, it's about listening and asking, oftentimes it's just asking questions to evoke, to evoke the answer, yeah. and to, you know? So here's the problem. What do you think we should do? Well, what are your thoughts? Well, why do you feel that way? And keep probing um, as a guy by the side versus a sage on stage. And that really, that kind of stuck with me. Yeah, well, I, and I guess for myself, the advantage that I have, maybe that others don't, okay? First of all, I was a nurse. Right. So guess what? You come see me and you got 40 <laughs> questions, okay? <laughs> Second of all, I'm a first aid trainer, okay? Yep. So I teach people first aid and what part of the first aid training is. You keep asking why until you get uh -huh. the answer, okay. right? And now with my health and safety background, it's kind of the combination of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody's going to come to me with a first aid report, let's say, and they go, yeah, I cut my finger. Well, what'd you cut it on? Well, this, um, what were you doing? <laughs> you know, and it's just these questions keep coming. And part of it, like I said, is my working history. Yeah. Right. A patient would come to me and I'm sure that by the time we were finished, the screening shall we call it or the the 20 questions right they would be like holy cow you know my whole life history well that's what i need to know in order to 
to help you or fix you or do something with you, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that I probably portray that a lot when somebody comes into my office, right? And they have a question and like I, I've had somebody say to me, why do you ask a question when I ask you a question, right? And the answer is, <laughs> If I don't understand your question correctly, mm -hmm. I can't give you a good answer. Mm -hmm. So I need to ask a question to understand your question. Mm -hmm. And often that's what we, we as leaders need mm -hmm. to keep thinking about is that mm -hmm. when you're communicating and you're listening, sometimes your listening skills need to be honed a little bit better to communicate properly. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I like that. Integrity and honesty, communication, which being a communication expert, which involves listening. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, what is the third? Enthusiasm. So if I can't sell myself and my job, I will never be able to sell anything. Okay. I, um, if somebody comes in to talk to me about an issue out in the floor, I want to go there. I want them to show me. I want, I want to be involved. Um, I want to be enthusiastic. I want to uh, make sure that they understand that I care about what they're concerned about. Um, and the best part about enthusiasm is it needs to be contagious. So if I get involved and they get involved and someone else gets involved and we pull in the supervisor and suddenly we have four brains thinking about one issue and we have a solution in four seconds. Right. Right. Um, you also have to portray it. You can't say, oh, yeah, I'm really enthusiastic about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, make it yeah, that's not something you can fake, right? Yeah. So the reason or where I, I guess I, I really feel that enthusiasm is part of a leadership is I used to be a salesperson for a certain product. Mm -hmm. And somebody said to me, you know so much, you must have been selling this forever. And I said, no, I just listened to what people told me mm -hmm. about their favorite product and now I'm telling you. And I said, and then that makes you tell me something about your favorite product. And then I can tell the next guy. Mm -hmm. And I said, and suddenly before you knew, know it, not only am I a wizard at this product, mm -hmm. but I'm enthusiastic about doing it. And I believe in it. And enthusiasm and belief kind of walk hand in hand, right? If you can't believe in it, how can you be enthusiastic? Let me ask you a follow-up question. So let's say a leader is leading a team of direct reports. They're not, um, how do I say? They're not in the right place in their career. The leader is not in the right place? Correct. Okay. But they're passionate about helping people, enthusiastic about helping people. But, you know, I don't know. They're working in, I'm picking on someone in tax. I apologize. But they're working in tax. They're working in tax and they really don't want to work in tax. But they have a team of five people and they love those five people and love cultivating those five people. Can a leader be enthusiastic and sell it if they're passionate about the people or do they also have to be passionate about the job? What do you think? I think that if you have a really good team, your enthusiasm can show through those people. Mm -hmm. And maybe their enthusiasm is more for the product than the job itself. And mm -hmm. so that you kind of bring the best of both worlds there. Right. I think that there has to be a tiny grain right. of enthusiasm about the product. I think you're because right. Because how do you grow it otherwise? Right? You like it's great. Potential. Yeah, you gotta you like having um, having enthusiasm uh, about fostering your um, employees' traits. Right is 
is great and that will that will should pull off of your employee traits mm -hmm. but if you if you have this let's say chip on your shoulder that you really can't get into the product you really can't get into the task whatever else mm -hmm. that tiny little thing is going to pick at that enthusiasm a bit right, right. so i think that if you can um first of all work on the enthusiasm of the your employees mm -hmm. and that even one one person has that small grain of enthusiasm mm -hmm. for the product then you can kind of pull each other together through it sort of thing i i think that um the whole thing with that enthusiasm towards the product or towards the employees is if you can hype up your employees, I think the rest of the enthusiasm can come. The enthusiasm, the strategy, everything. Yeah. 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 I agree. Uh, the reason why I asked is from a personal perspective, I'll let you get, get your thoughts on that. So years ago in college, I got invited to tutor accounting and I was the accounting tutor at the college for two years on two campuses. And my background is in finance. Uh, I've taken accounting classes. And let me just be clear on the rec record to state, accounting is not my favorite subject. Um, <laughs> and I, um, so I tutored, I felt the pain of not liking accounting. <laughs> I mean, just being honest. Yep. And um, that was a turning point for me because I had tutored math my whole life and I love math. So then I'm like, oh, I tutored a subject. I love it, great. This is the first time I had tutored something and I really didn't like the subject. But when people came to me, I was like, oh, no, don't worry. I'm going to break it down. It is horrible. You're right. I'm going to break it down. <laughs> no, well, accounting is so important. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, but I didn't really enjoy accounting. It didn't really connect with me, although I understand it's important, but I didn't really like it. Right. But it was okay because I got joy from breaking it down and cracking people's codes and helping them learn. But okay. if you said, Michelle, that's, that was kind of that context. But if you said, Michelle, now I want you to become, you know, a controller or, you know, or, um, or an accounting supervisor. And that is accounting, right? All, all the way. And now you have your team. I think that would be a little bit different um, for me anyway, just speaking right. personally, because there is something different when you're responsible for one person's professional growth in a limited scope. Well, when you're talking in an organizational setting, to your point, you cap the potential of the of the department, of the team, of, of the business. Of, yeah. um, so it's, I think it's just there's more at stake. Um, so you you're right. I think you need to have a grain at least. Yeah. Uh, you have to probably have a couple more grains if you really want to be good at your job and inspire a team and grow a team. Uh, well, the thing, like the thing is, that's when, as a leader, you start looking for that person who has the enthusiasm for the product, right? Right. And it could be somebody who's not even on your team yet. Right. It could be somebody totally outside your spectrum of, of the work, the people that you work with, right? And, I mean, leaders all over the world pull people from other teams. Yes. All over the world, right? Because they what they want or well i shouldn't say want what they need or how they want to groom the rest of their team is mm -hmm. by pulling this enthusiastic person into the group right because they already have they already have the enthusiasm towards their group yes so again that tiny that's so brain, valuable yes i yes. agree right so yeah even if they don't have the experience yet even if they don't have all of the soft skills needed yet, if it was a choice between someone who has, you know, uh, a lack of enthusiasm, but uh, has all the soft skills versus someone who's extremely enthusiastic and can't wait to sink in, but maybe needs some mentoring, I would rather take the person who's oh. enthusiastic and needs some mentoring. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic discussion tonight. We accomplished, <laughs> accomplished a lot in a short period of time. You know, to recap, viewers, uh, you know, what we talked about is, um, you know, really picking Roberta's brain, especially in the health and safety professional, uh, especially with regard to what's going on right now in July 2020. 
um, with COVID-19. So thank you so much for weighing in on how to make people who are coming back to work into a physical workplace, how to make them feel safe. And then you talked about um, what your, one of your biggest challenges as a leader that you have faced, which was the struggle letting. with letting go, which is <laughs> so relatable. I think there are people watching right now who, who completely get that. I would say, I, would, I don't know what percentage, but I would say the majority of leaders watching on some level struggle with letting go. Uh, so that was, that was fantastic. Um, and the third and final was uh, question was with regard to you know what what would you say are the top three leadership characteristics that um, that we need to have right as leaders yeah and um, again to recap it's integrity and honesty to be a communication expert which means listening as well love that um, and then I would even add to that too, in the digital age with more people working remotely, you have to be really intentional about that communication because you can't yep. just swing by anymore at their desk, right? So right. that's so important. And what was your third enthusiasm? enthusiasm? Fantastic. So Roberta, thank you so much. Uh, before you go, um, I always ask each guest to offer two things. Um, and I have those things um, from you, and I'm going to ask you why you picked them. The two things I ask of every guest is, um, can you offer a resource, some kind of a, a book or a podcast or an article that viewers can um, take advantage of that will help them on their journey um, to leadership and organizational change? And can you please um, share one of your favorite quotes? And the resource that you shared was a book. Me, You, and Q by Trina Chabot. And why did you pick that book as the resource to share with viewers? So probably if anyone's looked at the book, it's about mental health. So Me, You, and Q talks about ways for you to deal with it personally, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, professionally, as well as people surrounding you, right? Mm -hmm. So especially, and I, I want to bring COVID up at this time, people are either nonchalant about it, who think that they're invincible and nothing can happen to them, or they are so terrified, and if they have any mental health issues, they're going to portray it through that, right? So this book is basically um, a learning tool on how to watch for those things, how to pick them out of a crowd, shall we say. And um, the cue is about the questions. Is there, are you asking the right questions or giving the right comments? Nobody wants to hear what's the matter with you? What's wrong with you today, right? They want to hear you saying things like, is everything okay? You want to talk about it today? Is it, you know, um, I, people know I have an open door policy and I guess every once in a while I have to say, okay, I think you've wasted your 15 minute break on talking to me, but that's okay. Cause I was listening. Right. Um, so that's basically what this uh, is about. She is actually a speaker that I just recently um, heard at a web uh, cast, because of course everything's virtual nowadays. You <laughs> can't, can't go sit in a conference and actually ask the questions, right? Um, and she actually goes into workplaces and, and speaks about this kind of stuff, right? So that's, that's my resource, because right now with everything that's going on in the world, mental health is gonna become a much more impaired apparent injury, shall we say, or illness at workplaces. Yeah, so fantastic. I, I wonder if hopefully it'll be less taboo to talk about mental health in the workplace more yeah. and more. more. Fantastic. In yeah, in Canada, it's becoming more and more apparent. Um, um, this conference or this webcast that I went to was all about mental health, right? Awesome. Yeah, fantastic. 
Thank you. And the quote that you are leaving us with today is change your thoughts and you change the world by Norman Vincent Peale. Change your thoughts and you change your world. So why did you pick that quote? Well, let's put it this way. I've always been a firm believer in faith and positive attitude. Um, my nickname at work is Smiley because that seems to be what's always on my face. Um, right now you can't see it because it's covered up by a mask all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you should put a smile on the outside. Yeah, of I'll, have to, yeah I'll have to get one of those <laughs> smiley face masks. Um, because um, even on a Monday, when most people dread Mondays, I walk in and say, happy Monday, everybody. First day of the week, only four more to go. Right? <laughs> Things like that. So I think that if you can change your thoughts of negativity, yeah. to positive thoughts, okay? Um Something I learned growing up and in my life is each person should carry a notebook. And the notebook doesn't have to be really big. It's just a small notepad in your pocket. And at the end of the day, write down three things that you think positively about, okay? So it might be, the first one might be, thank God, the day is done, right? That could be that positive thought. Um, it could and before you know it, those a little bit negative, positive thoughts mm -hmm. start turning to positive thoughts where, um, holy cow, I got like, I, I didn't think I'd get all this work done today. Or I can't believe how many people helped me. Or I can't believe how good I feel about the day. Right? Things like mm -hmm. that. And I think if you can keep patting yourself on the back each day with three things, mm -hmm. You just change the world. The attitude that mm -hmm. comes from you starts to be portrayed outward. Absolutely. And, and people pick up on that, right? It gets infectious. Yes. Yes. And I, I, well, I love that because that's right up my alley about really understanding, you know, you don't have to be a, uh, a scientist who studies the brain or a neurologist to know that, um, we are wired in our brains. You don't have to know the nitty gritties of it, but you do know, we do know through repetition, affirmations, positive thoughts, um, that we actually train our brains to yep. be more positive. That when we have a stimulus, then it will, it will go for the positive thought as a habit versus the negative thought. Right. That is so powerful. That's a game changer. Yeah, it really is. Like if you, I mean, I'm sure in your role as a leader or anyone else's role as a leader, if you have somebody who comes into your office day after day, has nothing but a frown on their face, has nothing good to say about anything, that's someone you don't want on your team. You don't want, you don't want them to be successful because they're not going to be grateful for any success that they have anyways. So, I, okay, you opened up a little can of worms and I can't uh -oh. let you go. I uh -oh. can't let you go. If you had wanted to end this call, it's impossible. I can't let you go. If you have someone that's negative on your team, uh, and I actually bring this up too because um, the last term I taught um, online, a lot of students talked about actually like a feeling of helplessness because they were surrounded by someone so negative. They, they put earbuds in and everything. One yep. person actually had a transfer department because they couldn't handle it. Uh, if you are a leader and you have someone who is in your team who is very negative all the time, just like you described, what should that leader do? The well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a perfect example. This happened to me a number of weeks ago. Oh. I have someone in my workplace who challenges me negatively every time I see her, okay? Um, it got to the point where I um, basically was gonna uh, take her to HR and say, listen, this is, she's becoming harassing already, right? Mm -hmm. And then I thought about it and thought, okay, she's well liked at work, She's in a job position where she can be a leader 
And if I do it the way I had intended to do it, I'm going to just encourage her to be more and more like that. Mm -hmm. So instead, I went to my boss and I said, I really feel that between the two of us, we need to talk to her and tell her that she's a benefit mm -hmm. to our workplace, that she's quite knowledgeable and people look at her in a leadership type of way and that her aggression or um, she's very loud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, she's the type of person who can command the crowd, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And um, she likes to get in people's faces. Mm -hmm. So my boss said, okay, let's do that. And we brought her into the office and I basically let my boss be more of the, mm -hmm the mentor part of it because she also works for my boss. Okay. And by the time we left the office, she was smiling. She was apologizing for being rude. Um, she, um, her, uh, her comments were things like I, I was trying to, I'm very passionate about what I do. And if I find an issue that I get passionate about and I get loud and aggressive and whatever else, and my boss said to, turned to me and said, is there anything you have to say? And I said, the only thing that I have to say is I love your passion. I love the fact that you bring things to the table that need to be recognized. What I don't love is that you say it in a way that embarrasses us both. We're great friends. <laughs> she tones down her talk her talk when we when she comes to tell me anything and one of her comments was well I didn't know you had an open door policy and I said when have you ever come by my office and the door isn't open and suddenly the attitudes changed right mm -hmm. so again if I can I both my boss and I instilled positive thoughts in her head and suddenly oh if you think i'm a you know i'm um, a bit of a leader and and that i can show people how to do this better and mm -hmm. oh okay well then you know maybe i don't have to get upset and yell and think negative thoughts all the time so fantastic I, so yes i opened a can of worms but hopefully now i've filled it up no <laughs> We are closing the can of worms, but that was a fantastic example. Thank you for sharing. I think it's extremely relatable. Whether it's in an office, out in the field, it doesn't matter. Someone who is passionate about their job, who needs to work on how they outwardly express themselves. Oftentimes they know. They know that they, I think many times people know if they're hot tempered or they're passionate, but they justify it because it's all for the work and they're very task oriented. But, uh, but when, when you have a, a confrontation with that person from a position of, hey, people look up to you. We appreciate yeah. you, actually. We actually really appreciate you. We think you're an asset. We would never want to lose you. However, you know, be mindful of how you project because of ABCD reasons. Uh, that's yeah. a totally different way to approach it. That also could be present a preventative for a big kaboom down the road. Oh, yeah, definitely. Problem, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, Yes, yeah, so you need to confront. You need to confront those types of uh, situations before it. Yep. yep, absolutely. Yep. What a lovely conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Roberta, Thank you. so much. Viewers, I know that you enjoyed this conversation. So many helpful nuggets to take away, especially especially now during COVID-19, some, some really relevant topics. So um, thank you so much, Good Roberta, perfect. for helping viewers to think about different ways to create positive social change out in the workplace from a position of leadership. And viewers, between now and the next video, think about how you can do the same.